Welcome back to our fourth annual Future of US China Conference. We hope you had a good lunch or break, depending on your time zone. We're about to start session four, Semiconductors and the Impact on the Relationship Between the US and China. This event is on the record and we are recording. Videos will be available on our website after the conference. If you have questions for any of our speakers, please put them in the Q&A box. Speaker bios and our full lineup is on our website and in our program. Links to those are in the chat box. Now to session four. Moderating is our advisory board member and head of our US China Center in New York, Orville Shell. Speakers are Saeed Alam, Stephen Ezel, Don Rosenberg, and HS Philip Wong. Philip is speaking on behalf of himself. His viewpoints are personal. Orville. Well, thank you, Margaret, and welcome to our uh, panelists. Uh, I have to say, I came away from the three sessions that we uh, heard this morning uh, with a, I think, an augmented sense of the paradox that we now find ourselves in. Uh, namely the relationship between the U.S. and China, that on the one hand, uh, the relationship is increasingly fraught and decoupling. But on the other hand, uh, there are many aspects of our business and trade relationship that are still quite vigorous and, in fact, uh, seem to be growing. But in the middle of this uh, welter of trade and business relations is one extremely interesting and important uh, uh, element, and that is the whole uh, question of microchips, which in many ways are uh, uh, an elemental part of what keeps our world running. And this problem is made even more uh, complex by the fact that 92% of all the uh, sort of most advanced microchips are made on the island of Taiwan uh, by TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. And nobody is quite sure that if things be continue to become more tense, uh, indeed, if perchance something by way of a conflict were to erupt, uh, what is the fate of uh, the island of Taiwan, the, the uh, company TSMC, and thus the whole supply chain for the world of high-end uh, microchips? And that's what we're here to discuss today. So let's start. Um, we have um, uh, uh, some wonderful panelists. Um, Syed Alam uh, it works for Accenture and uh, runs their semiconductor practice uh, and is responsible for their, their business around the world, uh, from fabs to equipment manufacturers, foundries, and IP companies. Uh, Don Rosenberg uh, is just stepped down from being the general counsel and vice president at Qualcomm and had many years of experience in this field uh, before that with Apple and IBM. Uh, Stephen Izell is the vice president of global innovation uh, at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Uh, and he focuses on science and technology policy. Uh, and finally, uh, Philip Wong is a professor of uh, uh, double E at the Stanford School of Engineering. And he has also served as vice president of TSMC uh, in Taiwan. So I think we've got uh, four people that really will cover this field well. Uh, let's start with you, Syed. And I'd like to ask you, just since not everybody uh, comes from this world, for you to tell us what is a microchip what goes into making them, and where are they made? And let's all of us try to limit ourselves to five or six minutes so we'll have a good deal of time for discussion and questions. Syed. Thank you. And <clears throat> microchip is an integrated circuit uh, and is uh, called chip in a short form or semiconductor. And it's basically a combination of transistors uh, doing certain <clears throat> functions for which the chip is designed for. And it goes through a very a uh, complicated manufacturing process. Some of the advanced chips now are being done at five nanometer, which means the transistor size or the, the, the pitch size is around five nanometer. And to just to put things in perspective, I sometimes highlight that uh, uh, the, the diameter of COVID virus is 100, 100, 140 nanometer. And some of these advanced chips are being manufactured at five nanometer. So just to put things in perspective, how um, scale uh, comes into play and how complex this manufacturing is. And uh, the manufacturing process uh, or the overall supply chain of semiconductor um, is spread across the globe. Over 
last 15, 20 years, semiconductor industry has been uh, optimizing the supply chain for efficiency and cost. And uh, they have selected the best uh, value chain or the supply chain uh, to serve the industry. And now we have a scenario, the way the chips gets to consumer, just to paint the picture, a chip could be designed in California by a company like Intel or Qualcomm um, with the IP coming in from UK based companies such as ARM. And then that design is being uh, run through in manufacturing processes for front end or the wafer fab manufacturing um, in, could be in Taiwan, uh, as you pointed out, especially if it's leading node, using the equipment that's made in Netherlands or Japan or United States, using the substrates or raw materials or chemicals from Japan, United States or other Asian countries also. And then uh, after the wafer manufacturing for the final assembly and packaging, the chips could be shipped to um, Singapore, Korea or China uh, for final assembly and packaging. And then the chips could be warehoused in Singapore or some other Asian country and then shipped to China for final manufacturing as an OEM product. For example, it could be a phone or a gaming device or something like this. And then once the chip is put in into a final OEM product, it's shipped uh, to around the globe. So in this process, as you can imagine, uh, we did a research and it indicates that a chip and its component through manufacturing process could travel up to 25,000 miles or cross border 70 times. Um, so I just wanted to paint that picture that, you know, it's not a one-stop shop, that one plant that does the manufacturing. There is a complicated uh, supply chain, very much geographically distributed around the globe with, with different companies playing key role in each one of those uh, components. Well, thanks, Syed. I mean, I think what you're suggesting is that if there ever was a model uh, of successful globalization, uh, the microchip industry is, is perhaps a poster child. And yet here we are in a world that is contemplating deglobalizing, uh, returning to more autarkic economies, uh, protecting their own uh, supply chains and having their own capacity to generate the natural uh, materials that are, are used in those. So I thought we'd next we turn to uh, you, Don, uh, Rosenberg, because you've toiled long and hard with Qualcomm. Qualcomm is certainly a leader. That's one of the companies that's really kept the United States in, in an ascendant role in the whole microchip question. And yet, Qualcomm is sort of an incomplete meal. You design, but you don't make. Uh, talk to us about the dilemma uh, that a company like Qualcomm now finds itself in and how do you assess the prospects going forward for America to keep a certain ascendant role in this sort of overall uh, competition? In, in five minutes. In uh, five minutes. So uh, You'll have a chance to come back later, Don, and embroider. I'm, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> first, let me, let me be clear. As you said at the beginning, I was uh, – the executive vice president and general counsel of Qualcomm. I am no longer the executive vice president and general counsel of Qualcomm. So just as Philip speaks for himself, I speak for myself as well. And, um, uh, but I would say uh, in response to your question that um, actually Qualcomm has thus far managed through what I would call this, this crisis um, as well as one could expect um, for a number of reasons. First, um, Qualcomm has lived in this world uh, since the uh, onset of TSMC and the fabulous um, model. Uh, Qualcomm has always been essentially a, a fabulous uh, producer of semiconductors. It's a design house and it, has, it designs uh, the chips <clears throat> that uh, Syed has just, just described. Um, and so we've, uh, established uh, very strong relationships, not just with TSMC as a, a fabulous producer, but with Samsung, to some extent global foundries. <clears throat> and so um, in this most recent episode, of, and, and the industry um, 
has always had its ups and downs, by the way. It's, it's an industry that uh, moves from uh, gluts to, 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 the, uh, to the opposite. Um, and there's a complex uh, calculus that goes into the supply and demand of this industry, which again, unless you're a player in the industry for a while, you don't necessarily appreciate very much. And just as a quick little tangential segue here, uh, we all heard how, how much the auto industry has suffered uh, during the course of, of this last couple of years. Uh, and that's, in my opinion, in, in large part because the auto industry was not, A, used to playing um, in this game of supply and demand. They, uh, they um, canceled a lot of orders when they thought the um, demand for their products would go down, only to, only to see that that was not uh, as severe at all as what they expected. And then they tried to get back in line. And that, that was a clear problem for them because obviously uh, there are limited uh, numbers of, um, of chips available. Um, so the other issue with this uh, supply and demand process here is uh, there's a very real um, uh, disconnect sometimes between the original uh, forecaster at the end of the line and this long chain that I had described um, in between. And so uh, various suppliers make different decisions. For ex a simple one is TSMC might say, uh, I hear the, just to make it up, I hear the uh, supply forecast, the demand forecast rather for, from Apple, I hear it from Qualcomm, I hear it from others. I'm, I'm necess not necessarily gonna believe those numbers exactly and I may put a little a little twist on those myself to, to comport more with my my uh, view of, of what the demand uh, will be over the next year or so. So there's a little game playing there. Um, we, um, I think we, that is Qualcomm, um, uh, more than any other uh, company in its position, I think planned ahead a lot, including being able to take our designs and have them manufactured in different uh, facilities. TSMC, for example, has a different uh, DNA, a different process uh, to produce the same chip that Samsung might have. And you have to have designed, taking the, the various IP elements, for example, that I had mentioned, uh, and put them together in a way that fits the manufacturing process of a TSMC. Uh, and then you have to do that differently and work closely with Samsung, if you want them to produce um, your design. And uh, very few companies have the wherewithal, the capabilities to do that. Uh, we, we were able to do that. And so we were able to spread a little bit of our, I keep saying we, Qualcomm was able to do that and spread a little of our, um, our um, production in, uh, in different places. Um, and then, as I say, I think we, we uh, Qualcomm uh, uh, forecast well, uh, still was impacted by the shortage, as, as was everyone, um, but has, uh, has, has done fairly well. I'll stop there. We can go, go into more detail later. Good. Well, thanks, Don. Um, so, Stephen, let's turn to you. Uh, you are in Washington. Uh, as you contemplate uh, the situation that's kind of shaping up between the U.S. and China with, with Taiwan sort of in the middle, uh, how do you view it and, and how do you see the competitive advantage uh, between each of these countries? And uh, perhaps a word on what do you think will happen if we begin to decouple more and more and more? Well, thanks Orville and to the Asia Society for the invitation to be with you today for this great panel discussion. You know, um, alongside biotechnology during a pandemic, semiconductors really are the world's most important industry. The industry itself is $500 billion annually, but it supports $7 trillion in downstream economic activity across the global economy. And so semiconductors really represent the commanding heights of the modern digital economy. Uh, they empower every downstream digital tool from artificial intelligence to quantum computers and are a critical input from every industry from cell phones and laptop computers to automobiles and airplanes. And, and such, you know, semiconductors thus really represent a key flashpoint in the U.S. trying to contest for technology leadership. And both nations, I think, fairly wish to capture a greater uh, global share of semiconductor industry value added. 
uh, for the United States, actually, uh, the U.S. headquarter companies account for 40 percent, 47 percent of global revenues in the industry, with China being a key market. 36 percent of U.S. semiconductor industry sales uh, are to Chinese enterprises, um, making access to the Chinese market critical to American companies. Also, because revenues earned from the Chinese market enable American companies to reinvest those revenues into future generations of innovation. Uh, however, in Washington, policymakers are concerned that America's share of global semiconductor manufacturing capacity has actually declined from 37% in 1990 to just 12% today. And that has spurred congressional calls for legislation like the CHIPS Act, now part of the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act, that would provide as much as $50 billion to bolster the competitiveness of the American semiconductor industry. Uh, for China's part, of course, it also seeks semiconductor leadership. China's share of global semiconductor manufacturing capacity has actually grown from 1% in 2000 to 15% today, and it's estimated to grow to 30% by 2004. Uh, China is expected to add 40% of the world's new semiconductor manufacturing capacity over the course of this decade. And actually, the country is now number one in the world in total value added produced across all four phases of the semiconductor manufacturing process, from R&D and design to fabrication to, to, to assembly test and packaging. So I think it's well that China wants to become a key leader in, in the sector. Uh, but I do have a couple of concerns. One is if you go back to China's national IC plan in 2014, which called for $170 billion of investment in this industry, the plan also called explicitly for import substitution, namely to have Chinese imports of American semiconductors by 2025 and to eliminate them entirely by 2030. There's also a concern about aggressive industrial subsidization. When the OSD looked at the amount of subsidies to the global semiconductor industry they could find from 2014 to 2018, they found that 86% of the below market equity injections provided by governments went to Chinese semiconductor companies. And they found, quote, notably a direct connection between below market equity injections and the construction of new fabs in the country. Why that is concerning is because if Chinese or any other country as competitors in this industry are competing on non-market based terms, then that prevents companies trying to compete on market-based terms from uh, being able to earn revenues uh, and then reinvest in future generations of innovation. And for that reason, it's critical that enterprises from all countries in this critical industry compete not through innovation, but through innovation mercantilism. And that means competition unfolding in accordance with the foundational WTO principles of private enterprise-led market-based rules-governed trade in accordance with the principles of national treatment, non-discrimination, and reciprocity. So I think uh, that's part of the framing uh, in this uh, U.S.-China semiconductor relationship. And to address your point of uh, your question on, on, on Taiwan, yeah, while Taiwan only makes 20% of the world's semiconductors, it does make 92% of the most sophisticated semiconductors at that sub-7 nanometer process level. Uh, a recent report from BCG found that if access to Taiwanese semiconductors were disrupted for even just one year, it would cost global uh, consumer electronic device makers $500 billion and cost the rest of the global economy $350 billion in three years to reconstruct. Certainly with both the United States and China trying to more deeply integrate Taiwan into its broader economic orbits, um, how that relationship uh, is managed uh, will have uh, very dire consequences, I think, for um, the uh, global semiconductor value chains that have added so much value, have kept up the rate of innovation with Moore's Law, and lead to a lot of wonderful consumer products. Well, thanks, Stephen. Um, I mean, you you paint a, a somewhat alarming uh, tableau of what might happen if uh, uh, things begin to become even more fraught. Uh, in the Taiwan Strait. So let's let's turn now to, to, to you, Philip. Uh, you both uh, taught at Stanford and you've also, you're well acquainted with TSMC. Uh, describe this amazing company and how it all happened on Taiwan. And when, when you're there in the company, what are you thinking about the future? How do you imagine uh, this company will go forward if any number of uh, possible scenarios that are perhaps not particularly uh, uh, welcome uh, were to unfold. 
Thank you, Aubrey. Uh, first of all, I, I'm speaking for myself uh, again, just to emphasize that I, I did spend some time in Taiwan working in, in the TSMC uh, uh, about two years ago. Well, first of all, this uh, company right now is on the spotlight uh, almost every day in the news, and and, and that's kind of unusual uh, for uh, for engineers and time scientists. So we always always like to you know, put ahead on. Uh, Kind of uh, to use to uh, bring products into into the market and uh, uh, not uh, not so much uh, uh, paying attention to what's happening in the political world, but right now it's been kind of an an easily thrust into the limelight. Uh, the question about where where this company, uh, how it developed into the company it is today, uh, I would like to uh, 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 remind everybody that this company was founded uh, more than thirty five years ago. So it is not like this company started up uh, in, the, in, the, in the last five years and, and came, sprang up uh, out of no, nowhere and became the leader of the semiconductor industry and semiconductor world. It has been working on this uh, technology for more than 30 years. And uh, it, when the company first started, it was uh, manufacturing products that uh, no other US companies or global companies want to make uh, because the profit margins were low and uh, they uh, kept, kept their head down and, uh, and honed their skills. Over time, they have advanced on their technology and their ability to, uh, you know, to develop new generations of products. And their flawless execution, I think, is one of the key, point, key uh, elements of how they come to uh, the leadership position that they are today. And uh, in, in the semiconductor world, uh, every two years, there's a new generation of technology that is uh, being brought into market. And, uh, and, and today, we're down to about three companies in the, leading, uh, in the, in the race for the leading edge technology. And uh, at any point in time, if there is a mistake or a uh, misstep in executing that uh, uh, path from research and development, R&D, to manufacturing, if there's any mistakes or missteps, uh, you will immediately fall behind because the competition is very keen and everybody's running, all the leading edge companies are running neck to neck uh, with each other. So, the, so this is something that is uh, a kind of a coincidence of events that led to this uh, situation today. And uh, this company is, uh, I think, pretty op op optimistic about the future. Uh, a lot of people are, uh, uh, who are in the technology world uh, like to say that uh, technology in semiconductors advances are slowing down and, uh, and uh, in the future there will be more uh, economic benefits of uh, running products out of software applications and services and so on. Uh, but I don't, uh, as a technologist myself, I don't see this happening. Uh, because the uh, there is, is, is really increasingly clear that advances in software and applications are really closely tied to the ability to build the actual physical system. Uh, for uh, even in the metaverse, where you have a, a virtual reality integrated with the, with the real reality physical world that we are we are living in, uh, the physical uh, system takes a center stage because without the physical system, you cannot enter the virtual world. Uh, you need something to enter the virtual world. Uh, so we are doing this meeting in, in, in virtual space, right? In the, in, the, in, the, in the cyber space, but we all need a camera, our computers, uh, whatever the devices that you need to have to enter this, uh, this space. And today going for, and if you look at the products that companies are putting out today, uh, these physical uh, systems, are uh, increasingly require a very close connection between the uh, end product design and the physical things that you need to build the system, namely the semiconductor chip itself. So I think that, that going forward, semiconductor is gonna be uh, even more important, if not uh, uh, as important as it is today. Well, th thank you, Philip. Uh, I mean, I think all four of you have established beyond a shadow of a doubt the sort of critical role that semiconductors now play in all of our societies and in the whole functioning of the global economy. And yet, uh, overlaying this sense of dependency that we've built up over the last few decades 
it are some very, uh, I think, bitter geopolitical realities. So I'd like to, before we uh, go to questions from the audience, just pose to you all, uh, what is your response uh, as to how we should proceed uh, if, let's say, we have a clash in the South China Sea? if there's some move on Taiwan, if there's some global precipitating incident, which really physically disrupts the ability of this very fragile system, which we've developed between China, Taiwan, US and the world, uh, then what? What are you all thinking? You're in this world, what's the remedy? Who would like to start? Just raise your hand, Stephen, and then Philip. Yeah, you know, I'll offer my frank view. Uh, I have noted that 36% of American semiconductor industry sales go to China. That's a reality. Uh, earlier in the session today, I believe uh, one participant noted that uh, companies had estimated that about a half of global demand for certain consumer products are found in China, for instance, right? I think what we need to do is to build up technology ecosystems in other parts of the world, such as India, Latin America, Africa, help those countries uh, grow their markets for production of information and communications technologies like laptops, computers, and cell phones, which are so important from China, so that over time, we reduce our long-term dependency on access to China's market. So we can say in a decade, well, just 15% of our sales have to go into China. And in so doing, we've built up economies and technology ecosystems and like-minded countries across the world uh, to reduce our long-term dependency. I think the other thing we have to do, uh, was also discussed this morning, I think it's imperative that whether the Biden or Trump administration like it or not, we have to join the CPTPP. We have to start to engage in framing the rules of the road for the development of trade and economic structures in the Asia Pacific, uh, especially important if both Taiwan and China are also considered join this agreement. So uh, deepening American economic engagement in the region and building up tech ecosystems among like-minded countries across the world. Philip. Yeah, so I was about to uh, I say pretty much the same thing as uh, Stephen in here. I, 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 to start, I, I would like to uh, have a quote from uh, Stephen's article back in 2012, and it says, uh, former National Economic Council Director uh, Larry Summers contends that America's role is to feed a global economy that is increasingly based on knowledge and services rather than making stuff. Well, it really depends on what kind of stuff you're making. And uh, in semiconductor, uh, manufacturing is extremely important. So making stuff is really important. And our, uh, to prevent or kind of forestall uh, such a disruption, our role is really to bolster our own uh, manufacturing efforts in semiconductor manufacturing chips. As I mentioned earlier, uh, semiconductor technology advances extremely rapidly. Every two years, there's a new generation of technologies that is brought into manufacturing. And this rapid cycle requires a really close coupling between R&D activities and the manufacturing of technology products. And companies need to really plan and execute almost flawlessly from R&D to manufacturing within this two-year cycle. And this involves thousands of engineers. Many of them have PhD degrees. And as such, in semiconductor technology, manufacturing and R&D really goes hand in hand and if we lose manufacturing, especially in semiconductor technology, we will eventually lose our competitive edge and our, net, and our edge in the R&D and innovation as well. Uh, there are some that says that the US will do the R&D, uh, even in semiconductor will do the R&D and will let China and the rest of the developing world to do the manufacturing. Well, this strategy has proven not to work as we saw today and uh, innovations have to be translated into actual products and having those infrastructure, especially the manufacturing infrastructure, uh, is essential for this translation. With the departure of manufacturing, really particularly in IT and semiconductors, we will soon lose our edge in innovation and R&D as well. And so we really need to keep our edge and we must invest in building that infrastructure that enables translation of innovation to products. So if I hear you two correctly, and then I'll get to you, Don, uh, you're both in, a, in essence saying we need to reshore more elements of the complete process. We cannot simply afford, as we once did, to think uh, we can get them wherever they're made most cheaply, most efficiently, and supply chains are most rapid. Uh, is, is, would you agree with that, that statement? And then let's turn to Don for a comment. 
So in other words, if I hear you correctly, you're, you're both suggesting that we ought to take a book out of Mao Zedong's, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, theory of thought that namely autarky in certain senses, in certain fields is not such a bad thing. Yeah, I'm not saying that we need to do everything within the U.S. I uh, think uh, the, as some of you has, uh, has uh, talked about, this is a very global activity. As uh, Sayat has mentioned, it's very global activities. We just need to make sure that we partner with the like-minded countries that grow by the same rules as we do, we do in our businesses and uh, make a, a very strong effort and build a, a strong alliance. So, Don, what does this do to Qualcomm's markets in China? Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not going to, let me not answer that directly about Qualcomm, but um, I, I had a couple of comments here. First of all, on the last point, um, uh, I, I agree, uh, uh, Orville, with, I guess, Philip, uh, autarky. Um, I mean, China has been talking about that for a long time, back to, you know, at least 10 years or more about um, indigenous innovation. I heard it constantly. Uh, 10, 12 years ago. Uh, so there's always been this focus there on needing to uh, be self-sufficient as much as possible. And I, I can understand that, and I, I can understand why we ought to feel it. We need to be as self-sufficient as much as possible, but as has been said already here, uh, it, it's practically impossible uh, in the world we live in, certainly in this world of semiconductor technology because of the global nature of the, uh, uh, of the entire um, uh, life of a, of a semiconductor, as has been now said many times. A couple of things I wanted to just point out. One is, uh, yeah, I, I, it's certainly it's certainly good that we're now focused on uh, seeing whether we can build more foundries here in the U.S., uh, whether or not um, there is this uh, catastrophic event of, of uh, China moving on, on Taiwan, or at least potentially catastrophic event. Um, but we've got we've to do a lot more than we're doing. Uh, the U.S.'s number at the moment is $52 billion is interesting, but uh, TSMC and, and Samsung alone, they're each going to spend at least two or three times that amount of money. Uh, and yet the U.S. is saying, and, and the 52 is not even for foundry. By the way, for those who don't know, a foundry today probably costs close to $20 billion to create. And uh, Philip talked about the, uh, the constant advances in design. You don't just turn one fab facility, foundry facility from the previous uh, uh, node technology into the new node technology. You build another fab or you completely convert the existing fab, which is the way uh, Intel does things, for example. But TSMC, which has now, you tell me, Philip, I think it's almost 20 individual fabs. They're all basically devoted to the various nodes that they were built for. And so the next node, they'll need another fab. Um, so this is an expensive proposition, and I don't think we've come close to being able to tell, tell everybody here how complicated it is to build a semiconductor after the complicated design process. It is extraordinarily complicated with clean rooms and, and, and avoiding impurities down to 99.9%. It is amazing that this is done, but it's done. And as somebody said, we're talking about nanometers, which are ridiculously small uh, number of maybe two, three, four atoms. Um, so, so we've got to focus on the, the difficulty involved, the enormous effort that would need to be involved, much more money, much more focused. And, the, and I'd say two more things. There are two critical elements here. One is people <clears throat> and skills, and the other is tools. We haven't mentioned tools, but the West does have pretty much much complete control over the essential tools that a TSMC needs to be able to produce these incredible uh, devices. Uh, the tools are either made and controlled by US, and there's one critical tool, for example, in the Netherlands, which is called uh, extreme ultraviolet lithography, which is absolutely required if you are to make the smaller, what are called leading edge nodes, which are the ones we hear so much about that Qualcomm and Apple use, for example, in advancing the technology. Only one company in the world makes those machines. Machines cost about $120 million. They're enormous, buses, size of buses. And so far, uh, China has not been able to acquire any of those. So that's a critical element, a choke point, if you will. And the other is TSMC has 
probably a few hundred, Philip will know more, um, very, very skilled, sometimes PhD level engineers who are critical to that very difficult technical process of producing the end product. We need more of those here in the US. We need to turn our education process on the, on the engineering side much more toward uh, producing things like that rather than only going into software design and development uh, or worse, going into finance. Um, there's a lot of critical elements that don't get talked about a lot in order to, at least in part, give yourself some ability of self-sufficiency, not complete self-sufficiency. <clears throat> So I can't resist one final question before we throw this open. Uh, all of you have in some time or other dealt with industry. Do you think companies factor political risk into their equations well? Because it seems to me we've got an industry here that's just got every possibility of having a torpedo put through its bow uh, by geopolitics. And how are we doing in terms of alternative scenarios if something happens? Anybody want to take that on? I just, I'll just say generally, a public company, of course, has to consider uh, every, every risk that might be significant to the company. And there's not one public company, at least that does um, international business, that doesn't consider some form of geopolitical risk factors. And those have to be included in, in any analysis. And, and what you do, like you do with any risk factor, is you try to uh, plan as well as you can uh, and hope for the best. Um, but um, uh, you can't ignore those um, those geopolitical realities. Syed, so, do you think in your world that the companies that you deal with have, have, have got a good, clear sense of what to do if X, Y, or Z happens out in Asia? Yeah, so companies, as Don pointed out, have been evaluating different risk factors, and this is one of the biggest risks, and uh, there has been some scenario planning or game theories done in terms of mitigating factors or shifting some supply chain, but uh, there are limited options available given the concentration that we just talked about. Um, and uh, so then that requires some of the thinking, can the products be supported by some of the uh, different kind of technology or trailing node if the leading node becomes unavailable. So there has been uh, scenario analysis being done and evaluated, but there are, as I said, limited options available because handful number of manufacturing and the concentration of certain technologies in certain regions. All right, let's let's turn to some questions. Oh, did someone else want to comment, Stephen? As, and also to note for, for the audience that this is really a global phenomenon as well. Mm -hmm. You're Part of its COVID digital recovery package is envisioning $140 billion of investments to grow their semiconductor industry. They're trying to attract Intel, for instance. Obviously, the US has attracted TSMC to Arizona. Japan uh, has announced they're going to uh, launch a new fab with TSMC. So um, countries around the world, in addition to companies, are, 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 you know, are, are, are trying to you know, diversify uh, the geographic location of semiconductor production. So there's more resiliency and, and, and stability in the system. Okay, here's a question from John Pomfret. How much uh, has the US, when it comes to chips, really decoupled from China? Other than Huawei, have other Chinese firms really been impacted by US export restrictions? Who wants to try uh, that one? I'll, huh? I'll, I'll step in. Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, Huawei, yes, because Huawei was put on the, what's called the entity list, which is about the most extreme. Um, but I'll give you one example, um, SMIC, otherwise known as SMIC, which is the, the, the uh, prevalent um, semiconductor manufacturing facility in China um, was uh, listed as a, I think this was a military end use list, but in any case, companies like uh, Qualcomm and others were restricted from being able to purchase uh, from SMIC. Uh, now, since Qualcomm has since obtained uh, a license to do that, um, so I'll, I'll get off Qualcomm now, but SMIC uh, produces uh, basically older, what are called legacy uh, semiconductor nodes. <clears throat> They're in, you, you hear us saying, talk about seven, five, three nanometers. These are 28 nanometers, 65 nanometers, still, still in use. And indeed, 
I'd say, and Syed can correct me, others can correct me, probably three quarters of the semiconductors we're all talking about, at least, are in this legacy category that are that is that is the demand is is autos, for example, don't use leading edge technology, they use legacy technology. The phone, uh, which I will tell you today, a phone has probably something in the range of 175 individual semiconductor chips in it. People think there may be one or two. 175 individual semiconductor chips in your phone. Probably, again, three quarters of those are legacy chips as opposed to uh, leading edge chips. So SMIC, for example, makes a chip that is used in power management, which is a, a chip a technology that has been around probably 20 years, same, same level of technology. And uh, almost nobody else in the world continues to produce that, uh, that size node because it's not within the, the profitable range for them or the, or the reasonable practical range for them. But SMIC does. And so they could have a chokehold, for example, uh, on these legacy nodes if the rest of the, uh, the uh, semiconductor manufacturing world doesn't start to build legacy node chips again as well. But I, I add, or Stephen can correct me if I, or Phil, Phil you correct me if I add. You're right, Don. I think the point, I think that's getting highlighted, and this is a very broad topic. I mean, we, we tend to talk about the, the leading uh, nodes. We tend to talk about the fabs, but you know, just taking, I mean, you need the complete entire uh, value chain uh, from getting the wafers made to actually getting the assembly and packaging done. And then you need to peel the onion for getting the packaging done. You need substrates and other things for some of the wafer manufacturing, you need chemicals and things like that. And we talked about already the equipment also. So that's, you need to understand the complete <laughs> level of details or the layers that's involved to getting the chips made. And, and so second, going even further up the value chain, if I may, you know, not, it's trying to 97% of the world's gallium and the preponderance of the world's silicon as well. So if we take it back to the critical minerals and rare earth elements that are informing these chips, uh, China is the critical source. Uh, and, uh, and it's really the, 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 the foundational part of the pyramid of the entire ecosystem in that way. Um, we have a, a question here from Kerr Gibbs, who was in Shanghai with the Chamber of Commerce, and he asked, China has reacted de to decoupling by investing heavily in their own semiconductor industry. How well have they done with that effort? Uh, if not great, then why? And I, I might add, what do you all think are the prospects of China quickly uh, let's say in the next three, four, five years, actually developing a substantially more self-sufficient supply of uh, essential chips. We'd like to try that. Don, well, anyone no else wants to? Oh, go ahead, Philip. Yes. Yeah, let me try it from an academic point of view, right? Uh, apart from the manufacturing uh, in academia, we will we want to look at. Uh, who is doing the best work in the, in research and development of semiconductors, for example? If you go back twenty years, or then uh, you you would you the academics in in the U.S. would say that China is not a player at all in R and D. Uh, but today, if you look at the uh, research and development that there is in the published uh, literature, uh, China has uh, tremendously come up to speed. And uh, in fact, if you look, uh, we just, our industry just has our most important conferences, uh, annual conference uh, a month ago in San Francisco. If you look at the papers that are being published that are specifically on uh, more current generation products, advanced technology products, there is zero, there is no papers from the US universities or uh, that covers that area. But uh, all the papers on these more, current generation or the next gen, next one or two generations of technology products are represented by uh, Asian company, uh, Asian countries, uh, Korea, Taiwan, China, and so on. But principally, China has come up to speed tremendously. So even in the R&D space, uh, uh, they have come up uh, uh, to speed uh, very rapidly. So Philip, let me just, uh, before we uh, hear from someone else, ask you, 
what is the singularly most important thing you, you think the United States ought to do uh, to keep uh, ascendant in this game? Well, the most important thing we need to do is to build the, infra well, build the infrastructure for the not only for the manufacturing, but also for the R&D. On the manufacturing side, uh, it is not just building a fab, as somebody, uh, as every, uh, many of the media publications or pundits have said, it is a whole ecosystem. It's the, the fab needs a whole ecosystem of suppliers and, and also on the surprise on, this, on, the, on, on one side and also customer on the other side. So the, more, the whole ecosystem needs to be built up in the US. And it's not just building a fab here and then a fab there. Uh, if you build a fab here and fab there, it won't get the effect that you want. Uh, on the, on the R&D side, you really need to build the whole eco infrastructure. Uh, Biden keep talking about infrastructure. Now, the infrastructure for R&D is extremely important. You would have innovators come up with great ideas but they have no way to, uh, to demonstrate uh, their ideas uh, to, uh, at scale. Uh, you would have uh, a system that is built in a small scale that is probably not good enough for prime time for a real product. And you need to be able to demonstrate and show that it's ready for prime time before industry will pick it up. And uh, the, right now we have uh, a uh, very robust uh, uh, venture capitalist uh, uh, type funding, and, but that's a good infrastructure for the, for the financing part of it. But um, the actual physical building of uh, prototypes and uh, experimental uh, 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 prototypes, the building, that is very much uh, uh, lacking right now. So Howard Chow asks, I assume the U.S. defense industry uses a lot of advanced chips from TSMC and Samsung. That presumably heightens the risk if there is a conflict in the Taiwan Straits. How does that affect U.S. security and semiconductor policy? Well, some of our DOD friends would say uh, 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 build trusted foundries. Uh, for those who don't know what trusted foundry is, uh, these are uh, these are foundries of fast semiconductor manufacturing plants that are the uh, 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 the employ all the employees are U.S. citizens. They go through security clearances and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, right now, uh, if you look at what the trusted foundries in the U.S. are producing. Uh, they are producing uh, technologies that are several generations behind the state of the art. So in other words, the, uh, uh, our U.S. Uh, defense uh, industry could not uh, continue to rely on trusted foundries, uh, this strategy anymore. What is more important to do is to develop uh, what uh, somebody calls, uh, someone would call zero trust or a quantified assurance uh, for, uh, for chips in which you would be able, you should be able to use uh, new technologies or innovations in in design, in software, in in other places to ensure that chips that are not produced by these trusted founders, by just by, basically just about by anybody, could be trusted in the in our uh, secure systems. So this is the the uh, approach that would be long term and scalable and uh, going forward. And by the way, $2 billion of our $52 billion chips package would be uh, chips for DOD uh, to facilitate further development of printed circuit board and IC manufacturing for the defense community in the United States. But is it not true that, that most uh, of our everyday sort of defense requirements for fighter bombers, missiles, et cetera, do, do tend to use a lot of uh, uh, older chips rather than the new, you know, 10, 7, 8, the, the, the smaller nanometer chips. No. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, given this, here's from uh, Faru Kwamad. Given this interdependence in semiconductors, if there is an eventual conflict, is time on our side or on China's side? There's silence is deafening here, Conrad. I think if we play our cost right, the time is on our side, but uh, we still have to, need to uh, have some cost to play. Yeah. Don, do you think we're playing our cards right? And, and uh, you know, besides the role that big corporations play, 
uh, what are the key pieces that we may need to, to inspire a bit into action? Well, I think, uh, I guess I'd, I'd go back to something said in a previous panel, I think by Anya and, um, and Deborah and Wendy. Uh, the, the, and, and we've alluded to here, which is the ideal situation is to figure out uh, how to coexist and continue uh, uh, with a more global approach to this. Um, and um, I think that maybe one of the things that we all have going for us is that there, there's no way to, um, to win on either side, so to speak. Um, if, to take your hypothetical, the, um, pardon me, uh, the, um, uh, to, China was to was to move on on Taiwan. Um, as we've said, I think already here, that doesn't ensure that um, they now have control of TSMC and its semiconductor process and production. There are too many key elements that would be missing, let alone whether TSMC would just continue to operate the way it's operated now. Um, and so it doesn't make sense, if you will, uh, for uh, China to do that, at least from a TSMC perspective, because they don't solve their problem. That said, I've worried that um, the more uh, the U.S. Uh, puts um, uh, constraints on China's ability, not just to produce um, in this environment, but to actually acquire what's needed, and we all have talked about how critical semiconductors are now, the more China will be put into a pushed into a box where they may conclude that even though, as I say, they can't win, they can at least try to even uh, the field a little bit by making life uh, difficult for the rest of the world, as difficult as it is for them. And hopefully, even if that were to happen, that would lead to negotiation, not not a complete uh, shutdown of, of capability. Uh, so. So apropos of your, your last statement, uh, uh, Don, here from Buck G, we have a question. Asking the question from the other side, can you discuss the risks to China of this competition and possibly things coming a cropper some way that would really rent the fabric of this global construct? Um, who wants to try that one? Well, you know, you look at Huawei, uh, the sanctions that the Trump administration uh, placed on that company has cost about a third of, of revenues over the past two years. So that's just one particular instance where the- Stephen, uh, maybe lean back from your, you're not coming through, you're, cut, you're breaking up. See if you can pull back a little and then get a better signal from you. Apologies. Uh, I was just saying that the sanctions that Trump administration placed on Huawei has uh, contributed to a loss of about 33% of the company's revenues over the past two years. So that's one clear indication of the, the need for a symbiotic relationship. You know, the other point to make um, is that to the extent, of course, China wants to have global leaders in a range of industries from appliances to automobiles to technology equipment, um, that depends on having access to best of breed lowest cost, best capability semiconductors. So, you know, the the the, uh, the downstream competitiveness of every Chinese um, company that uses semiconductors, you know, depends on their ability to remain deeply integrated into global trade and, and exchange in, in, in these markets. So that's why China would have much to risk if, for whatever reason, um, that, that relationship was to erode. Here we have a question from Ye Jieting who asks, is it possible to redesign the semiconductor value chain to be more aligned with the geopolitical trends of the US uh, and decoupling from China and to better manage risks, both economic and political? And if so, how? I think Philip, you've suggested that we need to, to, to sort of have the full uh, the, 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 everything from design, research and development to, to fabbing. Anyone else have any thoughts about how to, the U.S. could restructure uh, the, the supply chains that we now depend on? Well, you know, I think more, more diversity uh, would, would go a long way to benefiting many parties in the system. You know, for right now, if you think about um, Samsung chips made in the factories in Austin, uh, they're actually put on ships and sent to Malaysia 
uh, for the assembly uh, testing and packaging in the ATP process. Um, I think one thing we haven't talked about is as we get more into climate change and uh, the, the environmental impact of firms, uh, people are going to start to take a look at why this industry is putting those things on a ship and, and sending them across the sea, 75 trips around the world, I think somebody said. Um, this is why Mexico, the state of Sonora, right across from Arizona, has now launched a strategy to build up a kind of kind of a Mexican competitiveness in ATP uh, to create more of a, a, a deeper, more integrated North American semiconductor production ecosystem. I think we could consider those types of strategies uh, that would benefit the U.S. or partners like in Mexico um, and also lead to even greater uh, the, you know, regionalization of, uh, you know, within the global context of these supply chains, but in a way that bring more countries into fold, enhance their economic development, enhance their job prospects and benefits all. Maybe uh, we have, I guess, five more minutes, Margaret, to go. Let me uh, maybe in that those five minutes ask each of you uh, to predict where you think we might be in two or three years. Is this fabric that we built up during the, the sort of halcyon period of globalization, in your view, likely to come unraveled? And are we likely to sort of coalesce like oil and water into two great big different market systems that have uh, sort of soup to nuts manufacturing, design, and, and uh, uh, distribution of these chips? Or do you think the global proposition will in some measure uh, hold. Let's start with you, Philip. Well, there is a reality and there's a the hope, right? My hope is that uh, uh, everybody will come to a census and uh, understand. Let's talk about reality, Philip, because uh, <laughs> the hopes are... Yeah. Uh, no, the hope is really the, the everybody will come to understand the global dependence on everything and come up with a way to manage through this, uh, uh, the, this discrepancy in here. In reality, given the gridlock in, in Washington, uh, it seems that in two or three years, I think we'll see more of the same. Mm -hmm. Syed? Yes, I think we will remain in a hyper-competitive environment uh, in terms of uh, access to talent and technology. And uh, we will see more and more companies uh, start thinking about uh, long-term strategy uh, in terms of uh, supply chain and overall uh, value chain in terms of uh, getting to their customers and what kind of technology they're using and where they're getting it manufactured and start thinking about uh, potential options. Mm -hmm. Stephen. I think you're going to see an increasing number of countries and regions, the United States, the European Union, Japan, Korea, uh, announce kind of national semiconductor strategies. Korea just did so in May. Japan has just done so. The common denominator of all these strategies will be to increase countries' share of semiconductor manufacturing activity uh, so as to um, reduce these economies' dependencies on other countries uh, and to ensure they have a minimum viable capacity of domestic semiconductor production to sustain their economies in the event there should be a conflict. Don, how do you foresee the future? All right, couldn't get off mute. I, I, I was thinking that. Uh... I think Lincoln said the most reliable way to predict the future is to create it. Uh, so um, I don't like predicting, but I do hope that we think hard about how to create it, which in my view would be finding a way uh, to engage at a level that maintains clear competition and try to get back to uh, what we consider to be the proper rules of engagement. Um, but that uh, that doesn't go all the way to so-called decoupling, because as I say, we're, this discussion we've had is the primary example for why decoupling not only doesn't make sense, but it probably is, is uh, not possible, at least in the short term. Well, listen, I think we've come to the end of our hour. I'd like to thank all four of you uh, for an interesting conversation. Uh, this is a topic which is not going to go away. And I think it's one of the one of the topics that divides the U.S. and China in a way which is most com complicated, but most interesting of all. So thank you. Uh, and turn to you, Margaret. 
Our thanks to Orville, Saeed, Stephen, Don, and Philip and Orville. I know you've been doing a lot of work on this, so hopefully you'll keep us updated. You've all tipped the scales back to the critical urgent side of the U.S.-China relationship for this conference.